Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as Mark said, I'm the general manager of Fig Trees Organic Farms. Um, we've got properties based at Inverell and Grafton. Um, I started on the Grafton property about 20 years ago. Um, it was a conventionally run place and uh, there wasn't too much happening, as I'll mention in a minute. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to introduce my manager at Grafton now, Henry. Um, both of us are available all day today and tonight for any questions regarding, regarding the practical management of the property. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Kambanga people, and to recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay my respect to them, their culture, and to elders past, present and emergent. Um, I'm also going to take the um, opportunity to acknowledge the driving force behind my research for the previous 21 years. That's my three sons, Ben, James and Andrew. Um, when I was a young father, I, was, I started on the Grafton property. The, the, um, our youngest son was born a couple of years after I was there. But um, around about this time of year, happens every year, funny enough, um, there's three birthdays. All my sons are born within about two weeks of each other in October. So when I get the opportunity to talk at this time of the year, I'm usually juggling birthdays as well. So last year I did a talk up at um, Byron Bay. I was fortunate enough to be talking with Charles Massey and... I said, there's one condition, I have to be home in time for dinner <laughs> because um, it was my youngest son's birthday. So last night was my middle son's birthday. So, um, and, and there was another event a couple of years ago and I'll, I'll share that with you because it's relevant to organic farming. And um, Henry and I thought we'd go in this sort of, um, you know, fun little event in Inverell called the New South, New South Wales Barbecue Challenge. Um, so being the gourmet chefs that we are, we um, grabbed a bit of rump steak, um, threw it on some butter on the barbecue. I, th I think there was um, four teams, was it Henry? Or th four teams of three, you had about an hour to prepare, you know, do your thing. So, so I thought I just wanted to really present organic meat in a really natural state. So we, we took a nice slice of rump steak, um, just basically cooked on barbecue, but I thought, how are we gonna flash up the plate? So we. We, we did a deconstructed Caesar salad because you have to have all organic ingredients. So we got some lettuce <laughs> and um, yeah, croutons with local garlic and different things. So anyway, we put it all together. But um, after the, the heats, we, we were cooking a barbecue all day as well. So we were really busy. But after all the heats were done, Henry and I are sort of watching the points of the next heat. We actually won our round which was amazing. And then we were watching the other heats. <laughs> and and um, yeah, so one by one, we realized we were still front runner. We, we ended up winning that day with just some organic rump steak cooked in butter and this beautiful plate of other ingredients from the local area. But that meant we had to go to the final. So there was three or four chefs there on that day that we won. Uh, you know, with some outstanding dishes that I would have loved to have eaten. And then we've ended up in uh, Sydney, Everly Markets, I think, competing with the winners of these other heats. And there'd been a lot of chefs in those as well. Anyway, <laughs> the, the day of that event, getting to the relevant point here, was that was my oldest son's birthday. And there was one condition that I went to that. I had to be in home, <laughs> at home in time for dinner. So... Um, I had to fly down for that one and um, yeah, we ended up winning that one as well, just once again with some organic meat <laughs> cooked in butter. Um, it, it, when the ingredients are right and the flavour's there, we've, we've just had outstanding reports all these years about the flavour and the quality of um, grass-fed organic meat. It's, um, yeah, it's amazing. So um, anyway, lots of birthdays, lots of stress. Um, I've given up a lot of time over the years to, to advocate um, organic farming and the bigger reasons why I did it and I'm going to share my story with you today about why I actually got into organic so um, I'm also dedicating today to all the youth of Australia and my youngest son is one example um, they're very concerned about the type of future they will inherit so I'm dedicating today's talk to them um, so this is the story of fig trees organic farms um, it, it's a story of incredible optimism because the reason that I got into organics was I was a little bit like my son, but I was a lot older, but 
very concerned about what was going on with Australia, with climate, with water, um, and different things like that. So, um, so in addition to actually taking over a new manager's role, wanting to produce a really good quality organic meat and pasture, I started to identify that we actually had to do something about bigger processes like water cycling and climate. Um, what was really exciting, I suppose, was the fact that um, the industry I was already in had so much potential to actually make a difference in Australia and, and globally. Um, so I'm jumping back and forth from my notes and talking freely like I always do, so it gets very messy, so hang in there with me. Um, so as I discovered over the years, it is very hard or even impossible for society to head towards a desired destination unless there is a clear vision of where it is they are intending to end up. This is why I believe a holistic vision for the nation is critical. And so I'm gonna to commence today's talk with a vision for the future. Um, you've got the option of shutting your eyes here, but I'll leave that up to you. So I'm just gonna read this because I actually think it's the biggest thing missing in Australia and the world. Um, and it's based on holistic uh, management, Alan Savory's holistic thinking. So imagine we are living in, on an earth that has been fully regenerated. Imagine a world where children and their families live peacefully with absolute trust that their communities and their environment will be secure, safe and healthy forever. Imagine a future where the wisest and most respected elders in our community have instilled a sacred culture guiding the rest of the community towards the regeneration of our earth. Imagine a world where fresh, clean water is running abundantly out of healthy landscapes covered in deep, rich, fertile soils. Imagine a future where beautiful, clean cities of unprecedented natural beauty are connected with beautiful wetlands and lakes, feeding magnificent food and timber forests. Imagine a future where endless grasslands and wetlands are being carefully managed by expert land stewards looking after a prolific diversity of wild and domestic animals all working together in one grand cycle of regeneration of living ecosystems. Imagine a future where all food is naturally organic and we understand that these foods will not only regenerate our health, but will also regenerate the landscape and the ecosystems which we are dependent on for clean air, fresh water and a stable climate. Imagine a future with beautiful, sustainable cities where all the power for transport, housing and business is provided at very low cost enabling people to spend less time at work and more time sharing their arts with their communities. Everywhere we look, we see students and scholars, children and parents, community leaders and farmers working together to restore soils, gardens and forests, having a full understanding that these plants are restoring a balanced and stable climate. Imagine a world where all the nations and all the religions have been brought together through one united purpose, to love, regenerate and enhance our beautiful earth. I believe a vision similar to this is what drives a lot of organic farmers. This is also something I have been imagining for 20 years and something I think we can still strive for. And um, a hero of mine, David Suzuki states, all it takes is the imagination to dream and the will to make the dream a reality. So I'm gonna get on with my talk, but um, I truly believe unless we get some really clear goals for Australia and the world, we're gonna to continue to see the devastation that we're seeing all over the world now with bad leadership. And um, we really, I've been pushing for years and um, in my own lonely little way, my way of communicating, whatever that might be, um, that we need councils of elders across the world, um, in Australia, in the, across the world, actually coming up with some sort of charter that is rock solid that the world cannot, um, defy. So if we get a, a leader that um, Bolsonaro or Trump that want to devastate in you know, complete wilderness areas, entire ecosystems, it can't stack up. And there's plenty of people in this room that um, are in a position to actually take on that challenge of finding those elders across the world or even within the room. So restoring paradise through organic farming. Two questions to change the course of history and make the dream a reality. When do we start as a nation to make this vision 
a reality and what will it take for us to get from our current degraded situation to a restored and healthy earth? I suppose they were questions I was asking myself all those years back um, and I better not jump off my notes again because I'll end up repeating it two or three times. So, so there was a famous um, fourfold doctor in the mid 40s and early 9, 20th century, I guess. Um, and he said, the task before our generation is to strive with deep and thought to reach a truer and more valuable worldview and thus bring to an end our living on and on without any philosophy at all. He could actually see where we were going as a civilization and, and he tried to um, stem that and, and basically get us back on track. Uh, his worldview, which took him years to come up with, was simply a reverence for life. So, um, so when do we get started? I'm going to borrow a quote here from two great books, Charles Massey's Call of the Reed Warbler and Dan Barber's The Third Plate, where a Mennonite bishop questioned the farmer Klaus Mans. When do you start raising a child? As Klaus recalls, according to the bishop, child rearing begins not at birth or even conception, but 100 years before a child is born, because that's when you start building the environment they're going to live in. I think that's beautiful. So my question leading on from that one is, when do you start forming an ethical worldview for getting real and honest about restoring the ecosystem processes of this nation that we know are in trouble and restoring this planet for our children's future? And when do we start demanding truth and action for dealing with the multiple crises facing humanity making headlines right now as we speak? And I'm sure I don't need to tell everyone just the devastation that's going on in New South Wales and Eastern Australia at the moment, probably right across Australia. Um, I think I just heard on the radio this morning the way here, 500,000 hectares of forest has burnt so far this year in New South Wales, which is um, the equivalent of the last two fire seasons and we're only in October. Um, out in our district, we're looking at the landscape, the sides of the hills everywhere with the, hill, the trees are dying. So the ones that aren't burning are dying. We're, we're in a pretty precarious position. Um, and I'm comparing, and I don't mean to be sort of, you know, too dark about this, but we're starting to see what happened to the coral reefs in the late 90s happen on land. So if we don't take urgent action, if we don't sort of address these things, um, we're in real trouble. So the answer to my question is we start repairing the damage to the Earth's ecosystem processes and ecosystems right now. We leave here today and we affect widespread demand for laws, policies and a thousand year culture, if that's what it takes, of truth and action. We don't put up with any more of the bad decisions and I suppose I've been fighting now hard for 20 years, um, giving up a lot of time and sacrificing a lot to do that because um, I'm jumping ahead of my notes again, um, but the warnings have been out there for a long time. And to NASA's credit, the organic farmers, you know, that helped form NASA, they could see that this was coming a long time ago. And that was the whole purpose of organic farming, you know, is they, you know, to get the soil healthy, to get the waterways healthy, to, to do something about our future. So, so credit, credit to NASA for being an early adopter in exactly what I'm talking about today. So we base that culture not on a flawed view of the world, but we base that culture on a deep respect for the earth and for life. And we connect every decision we are making with the outcomes we want for the future of the planet. So the second part of that question was, what will it take to get from the current situation to a restored and healthy earth? So this is a question we have been working on for the previous 20 years at Fig Trees Organic Farms. And it's gonna sound in my talk, like I'm not going to talk a lot about the small practical things that we've done and, and there's been a lot of bloody hard work and fencing and splitting up paddocks and, you know, doing all those regular farm jobs. But I, I'm quite a big picture thinker, so we'll deal with the practical things in the few slides that I've got. But as I said earlier, Henry and I are both here for any, any practical questions on um, how we've farmed organically for 20 years and um, the holistic management side of that as well. So 20 years ago, when I took over the running of the property at Grafton, some of the issues I was confronted with were, it was 1998, so up until that point, it was a record hot year, which looks like a mild year now. Um, record temperatures, droughts, loss of water from the landscape, 
Um, it took, took me a little while, but I realised the mineral and water cycle had been totally smashed. Um, the pastures were nearly non-existent and the livestock were, were very poor. So as a young parent and farm manager, I had many responsibilities. So um, I've mentioned a few of these already, but in addition to improving the performance of the farm, pastures and cattle, which I had to do as the manager, I wondered what solutions there were for dealing with major challenges like an increasingly warming climate and a local water cycle that had ceased to function. I also wondered what else I needed to do to ensure future generations would have a secure future. I soon realised improving production of pasture and beef on the farm was not the only challenge. The bigger challenge was to look at ways on the farm where we could help restore local and global ecosystem processes. Now, this is the pathway that started heading me towards organic. You know, I started backing off, um, you know, um, the, the chemicals and heading into a biological pathway. You know, we didn't jump straight into organics. And, but, you know, I, I've got a feeling now that this is what's been missing in Australia. We, we are just not acknowledging the importance of living ecosystems across Australia that, that keep the water cycle flowing and functioning. And I've just been on a Western trip through the Darling where the Darling is, is bone dry, where the fish died. We met Kate McBride. The, 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 these mussels that are probably 30 years old are all baking in the bottom of the riverbed. They've been around, the, the Murray Cod's been around for 50 million years. And what happened when all those fish died, they knew they had to get back to the Menindee Lakes. But in the government's wisdom, which we found out was all about putting in a new pipeline for mining, they drained the Menindee Lakes to justify the pipeline. So these 50 million year old species were trying to make their way back as they've learned over the centuries to the Menindee Lakes and, they, and the river was dry. So um, they died, but we've got governments throwing band-aids at this thing they call a drought, and I'm opposed to the word drought. Um, We've, we've got a, a man-made disaster in Australia through neglect on climate and neglect on ecosystem processes with waterways. So, so I, it's taken me a while, but I, I, I now say a healthy landscape is the most valuable asset we have on earth. And everywhere I look, healthy landscapes are being torn apart. If it's not development on the coast, and I've just driven past it this morning, just more tracts of land, I think the RMS are the biggest land clearers in New South Wales for highways and roads, which help us get from one place faster, you know, one place to the other faster. So, um, you know, and then we're just devastating the rivers and waterways out west where, where these mega dams that taxpayers have paid for, for individual, a very small number of farmers are actually draining these rivers. And the floodplains that used to flood, the Murray, um, the Red River gums need flooding every five years. So, so if you can imagine, they were getting flooded at least every five years. That whole floodplain was hydrated. That moisture was billowing up through the vegetation back into the atmosphere and creating that constant water cycle. I mean, the legend that he is, Bill Mollison, put all of this in his Permaculture One book. It's all there, the Ekman spirals, the hydrology and, and once again, jumping ahead of my notes, but there's, there's seed in the biology that come out of a healthy landscape. So we talk about drought as if it's this mysterious thing that we can't do anything about and, and government's got no control. You know, we're talking about political parties that have you know, denied any environmental worth at all for a quarter of a century now. And it's been all about the economy, but they forgot what the economy was based on. Sorry, I, that's not in my notes. So it was around this time, um, you know, I, I was the fresh manager at Grafton. I'd, my career was sort of, you know, conventionally trained, high input, um, you know, but I'd finally got a chance to start thinking and observing. And so Andrew, my youngest son, was born in 2000 and, and that poor young bloke, he hasn't known a father that hasn't been fighting climate change, um, you know, ever since he was born. And but. I went back, my um, employer, um, we've got a very good employer and he supported me through a sustainable ag course. I ended up doing a master's, um, which, which I'll tell you in a minute. But yeah, so in, in, um, it, in that course, I came across a quote and I don't know, sometimes you read things and you know, we all read you know, social media nowadays and you see things and you'll 
forget it or you, you know, it, it's gone off your screen. But this was a quote I couldn't forget. So in 1990, at the conclusion of the World Commission on Environment and Development, over 21 nations from the world stated, we are unanimous in our conviction that the security, well-being and very survival of the planet depended on urgent, urgent changes. I read that the year my youngest son was born, so that was 2000, and I was ropeable. I thought, how could we ignore something where the world's future is at stake for 10 years? So it was 1990. So it's now been 29 years since that quote and we're still not making any decisions in this nation that really deal with the challenges. So back to the question of what will it take for us to get from our current situation to a restored and healthy earth? And what could, it po what could we possibly do to aid in the restoration of stable climate? So the, the answer came while sharing a glass of red wine with a good friend, and I'm sort of quite happy to sit down and have a drink with anyone for important topics or not. Um, and, and that, that man, a lot of you will know, is Adam Wilson. And we were discussing, um, I was very concerned about this quote and climate and water. And Adam was, you know, mentioning a few figures on humus and water and carbon. Um, so I started to understand the massive potential for humus to deal with some of these massive issues in the world. Um, so I went back to university and um, I'd already started on a sustainable ag course, but I went back and did my masters doing a dissertation on the water storage capacity of humus. Um, and I've been trying to raise awareness and present solutions on climate change, water security and, and health ever since. So I completed a master's looking at how we could secure Australia's water supplies, which I just mentioned, and in the same study, I identified carbon sequestration as one of the greatest ecological means we had for combating climate change. Carbon sequestration in that dissertation was just a side benefit to restoring water cycles in Australia, but I thought that might be an important subject, um, and I'll explain why in a second. So, on human health, I found the answer also lied in restoring humus and the nutritional integrity of soils. And if I don't run out of time, I've got a slide there, I'd like to talk more about human health. Um, so unlike chemically manipulated soils, healthy humus-based soils supply a full range of true amino acids, fats, and important phenolic compounds, which are, true, which are the true source of health for ecosystems and life. So after working on solutions for the previous 20 years, this is what I believe it will take to get from our current situation to a restored and healthy earth. You'll be glad to know I'm finally getting to the answer. <laughs> so we need a new worldview and a culture based on respect for life and a thorough connection with our atmosphere and water cycles. So as part of this new worldview, we need to fully acknowledge that we are responsible for protecting and enhancing at least five major foundations of life on this planet. Our actions on the ground are affecting these things. So we must connect our everyday decisions and processes with processes that are occurring in the atmosphere. So this is like elevating human thinking though. It's not all about what we're doing on the ground and how we get from A to B and the sort of flash house that we live in that's totally disconnected from the environment. We actually, every time we make a move, we're affecting our atmosphere, which our life depends upon. So we must also connect everyday decisions with the water cycle because the cycling of water, not water itself, is essential for ongoing, ongoing life on Earth. So dams are a joke if we don't start addressing the water cycle. We must connect everyday decisions with the Earth itself because a healthy biologically active soil covering the surface of the Earth, the skin if you like, is vital for ecosystem services and continuing proliferation of life. So we're looking, we're connecting with the atmosphere, the water cycle, the biology in the earth. Why are we organic? Why do we go organic? I mean, we could have been biological or just not gone. We didn't want to affect the biology in the soil. We, we had to stop impacting the biology in the soil and chemicals are impacting biology every time you use them. So we must connect everyday decisions with healthy forests and grasslands because diverse perennial vegetated landscapes underpin all life processes on the planet. And I continue to learn like everyone here, every day we keep learning, but 
in my quick study of the Amazon the other day and I'm looking at water cycling, I'm thinking all of that beautiful humus in the soil and, and it's, why did Bill Mollison talk about the humus detritus and not in the soil in the Amazon? The Amazon forests are some of the poorest soils in the world. The water, the pumps, that water cycling affects global weather patterns. It's in the vegetation. It's in that massive water storage in the leaves and it's cycling, it's going up, it's coming down, it's in the vegetation and the humus detritus. But life itself is what's creating the water cycle. These black box trees that I witnessed out west in the Darling area that are dying because of the starvation of water, the depriving the water from those black, they're 500 years old, they're only this high, like, but they're a critical part of the water cycle and we've devastated the vegetation. Some of you may know I'm a strong advocate against deforestation in Australia and it is absolutely devastating at the moment. Um, you know, the millions and millions of hectares that are getting knocked down at the moment right across Australia. And that is our water cycle. So the fifth thing there we must connect, and this is sort of a little bit out of it, my field. Well, it's not really, um, but um, we must connect our everyday decisions with processes that are occurring in healthy oceans and waterways because clean water in our oceans and rivers and floodplains, if you like, as well, underpin the biodiversity which keep our planet in a livable condition. A lot of our oxygen is coming from the ocean. So following my research, I realised that having a strong focus, <laughs> this was simplifying everything I just said pretty well. Um, following my research, I realised that having a strong focus on building humus would go a long way to helping enhance all of these foundations for life on our farms and across the earth. So I've probably already explained this, but I'll read it anyway. At this point, I should explain why I've held such a strong focus on affecting entire earth processes while looking after our own farm operations. And the answer is very simple. And I've been criticised for a lot of years about spending the time that I do on the big picture. Um, you know, should be in the paddock, you know, fixing a why. Um, but I, I figured out a long time ago, unless we tackle and influence all of these issues at the scale they need to be dealt with, eventually our own operation would succumb to impacts from climate extremes. So I've got, been going pretty hard with this operation for 20 years. We've built it up from nothing. We had a really beautiful brand. We've done a lot of education, a lot of information. Right at the moment, we've had to shut down our brand in organic beef. We would have loved to have provided the beef for this event. Um, we don't have any grass-fed beef at the moment. We, we basically rely on healthy ecosystems, healthy climate, healthy water systems, and at the moment, they're shutting down all over the country. So I'm hoping a lot of you are in a better position. Um, I know a lot of you have suffered just as much. So we, we have to deal with these big pictures. We can't let whoever's in charge or the politics or whatever keep undermining what's happening on the ground. And I think farmers are getting really screwed because, you know, you know I've read about organic farmer going broke out at, you know, Wentworth where I visited the other day because the water cycle's not happening, the water's not coming out. You know, we, we're getting screwed because we keep getting told that we're being looked after, but the only way we can be truly looked after is if the federal government and the state governments start looking after our environment properly. And an organic body such as NASA, and we talked a minute ago, Glenn, about opportunities, is in the perfect position. The world's largest certifier. I think I heard the other day, Australia's responsible for 50% of the world's global production. I mean, we're in a beautiful opportunity to communicate how we can restore the earth. Um, so so um, I've got some slides in a minute, but um, yeah, I'm not sure how we're going for time. I'll keep going to run out. So my master's study, which was looking at the um, securing Australia's water supplies through this beautiful substance called humus. Eventually, I worked out that one part humus was capable of storing on average four parts water. Um, Soils change with on every property, so it's going to be up and down, and and the potential is probably a lot higher to be honest. But I've I've been conservative. 
So what that means in real terms for farmers and community water supplies is that for every additional 1% of humus over one hectare at a given depth of 30 centimetres, the soil would be capable of storing an additional 160,000 litres of water. So for 10%, um, you know, that's 1.6 million litres of water per hectare, restarting the water cycle, you know, holding it in the soil, growing plants, feeding the rivers, pumping it back up. You know, politicians, you know, they're so annoying, you know, we can't make it rain. No, just look after bloody nature. Nature knows how to make it rain. So they're very annoying. So what are some of the other qualities of humus that make it so amazing? I mean, they're limitless really, but it's the product and source of life. You know, when life gets broken apart by the microbes, the old matter and sugars and everything, and pulling it apart and then they just reform it. So you've got the substance for new life. Um, it's amorphous, it doesn't have a defined structure, which I think really annoys scientists because they just can't pin it down. It's gel-like, it's a macromolecule, it's, it contains solid colloidal particles. So it's a solid in a liquid, is absolutely amazing. Humus has a surface area, just 100 grams of humus has a surface area of over 80,000 square metres. So humus in that glass would have a surface area of eight hectares. Um, it, can, excuse me, it can affect the entire soil matrix. Um, humus provides a home for a healthy microbial population, which builds more humus and creates rain and gives us our health. Um, so, uh, so just 100 grams of humus can contain over 250 billion microbes responsible for incredibly important ecological services like the building of more humus, holding of water, um, stabilisation of the climate. Uh, yeah, and there are, Humus also contains hundreds of thousands of different organic compounds which are essential for human health. Uh, I think William Albrecht mentioned 500,000 at his time, so there's probably a few more. Um, and it has five times the nutrient storage of clay. So um, just a bit more on climate now. One of the real dilemmas facing the world is that there's too much carbon in the atmosphere, too little carbon in the soils. So there's already enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to keep heating the earth for centuries. While at the same time, many of our agroecosystems are deteriorating as a result of having insufficient carbon. So building humus offers a real solution for reversing global warming and restoring a stable climate. If we were able to regenerate one hectare of land with 10% humus, we could sequester over 822,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent out of the atmosphere. Um, I think from memory when I started on the land, um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was around 360 parts per million, maybe a little bit less. Um, it's now uh, the highest level it's been in 800,000 years at 410 parts per million. Um, I heard years ago if we get to 450 that's like, you know, too far, all the tipping points. And I think we really don't even need to wait that long. We're just starting to see the collapse of big ecosystems everywhere around the world right now, including our own backyard. You know, we're losing forests. They're not gonna grow back. These ecosystems will not recover in my lifetime. Um, yeah, so we're watching the entire world deal with the consequences of record fires, heat waves, flooding, so forth. So, um, yeah, basically the earth's gonna keep heating for a long time unless we get that carbon out of the atmosphere and, and organic farming and um, sequestering carbon's a great way to do it. Um, but I've got a real concern at the moment and I started to talk, I, I, I actually had an interview with Michael Jeffries late last year, I think it was. Um, I first mentioned this at talks in 2016. Um, I was a really, really, you know, average high school student. Um, but I do remember something called temperate plants. And I remember they like a temperate climate. And when I see record heat waves 10 degrees above every day and Maury had 45s or yeah, in our district, 
So I just thought maybe that's a problem. So in the, uh, in the high school science resources, it says life on Earth is restricted to a narrow thermal band. Many temperate species cannot survive long periods of temperatures higher than 30 degrees Celsius. The ideal growing temperature for eucalypts is 11 degrees. So the point is if we don't take action soon to regenerate the landscapes with vegetation, to sequester carbon, to reboot an effective water cycle and to restore a stable climate, the one ally we have, the one real chance we have for ensuring intergenerational security will be lost. So there's a study in Western Sydney University and I've got what it says here. Um, I won't read it out because it says what I've just said, but um, is, I'll just read one line. Plants growing in the dry inner regions of Australia are at particularly high risk. We could see dramatic changes to the face of Aussie plant life in the future. That was 2016. So that's Western Sydney University research looking at, um, yeah, they've sort of all over the world. So I'm just going to um, go on to health now. Some of the most prominent voices warned universities and governments that human health was directly connected and dependent on the quality of the soil. So in 1943, in the middle of the Second World War, a sitting was held in the House of Lords in London. And some of you might have heard this from me before at a previous speech. But the intention of the special sitting was to take steps to restore the quality of nutrition and the health of people across the entire world. While still having to deal with the horrors of war, one after another, a distinguished group of lords, including Lord Teviot, the Earl of Portsmouth, Lord Gates, Lord Bledisloe, the Earl of Warwick and Lord Lentar, decided that not nearly enough effort was being made to ensure the complete health of their citizens and that urgent action must be taken. The issue at hand was to raise a motion for a Royal Commission to investigate the nutritive value of foods in relation to agricultural methods in view of their importance to the health of man, animals and plants. So Lord, Stev Lord Teviot states, the real object of, behind this motion is to see that we put planning for the health of our people, the animals, the plants and the crops of our country first. Lord Teviot continued, I have just had sent to me this morning a short passage from a very distinguished man. If your lordships will permit me to read it, he says, while recognising the value of artificials in crop production, the great reliance on artificial manures, fertilisers, in common use insidiously impairs the health of the soil, predisposes to disease in the plants with the results of unfavourable influence on animal nutrition and resistance of animals to disease with, in sequence, a similar impairment in human nutrition and resistance. And the Earl of Portsmouth states, and this is a shortened version of a Hansard that I have with me on this event, but if there is a, only a shadow of suspicion that for us and our population in this country, and indeed for all people in the modern world, health depends on the right treatment of soil, then I would suggest to your Lordships that there is no time for delay. Now, I've had sent word from a good friend of mine recently that's studying health and nutrition and climate that there hasn't been a decent worldwide study ever done on that exact subject and i'm getting a a nod there from lou so we we basically haven't revisited that and and uh, i'll go a bit more into health um in a second if i just didn't flick past it oh yeah here so so that's what I just said. It's never been acted upon, um, yeah, a comprehensive study. So one after the other, and those lords were studying nutrition all over the world. Lord Bledisloe, they were travelling, they were in, investigating different um, people all over the world, some that were less healthy, more healthy, depending on their diet. So, yeah, so despite that, the latest science on the role of the microbiome it's interesting, isn't it? In human health and the role of phytonutrients in preventing disease is really starting to indicate the need for more effort to be applied in restoring an organic state of soil health. And I haven't heard anyone talk about the importance of the microbiome without saying, eat organic food. So if we're going to look after our little guys here, and I've got plenty here, they, they, they need nutritious food. So you know, I'm, I'm going to, that's going somewhere. If I've got time, I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. So humus is the, true so uh, is the source of true health for animals and humans. 
as I mentioned before, it contains over 500,000 different organic compounds. It's five times the nutrient storage of clay. Such is the importance of the high nutrient storage of humus that its impact on the soil matrix. Um, just 3% humus in the soil can be responsible for half the nutrient storage in the soil. These nutrients and health compounds include essential amino acids, minerals, vitamins, and secondary metabolites. As well as storing vast amounts of carbon, humus also contains large amounts of nitrogen. There's a quote from Stevenson, who did a lot of work on humusin, on humus, humusin. Um, so at the core of the macro humus molecule is um, our proteinaceous substances. I think the average age of humus can be two and a half thousand years. The average age of, of these protein molecules can be sort of 500 years, but the plants have access to true protein um, as opposed to funny protein or crude protein that we measure most plants on today. Um, and all, this is a, another quote from Lipson and Nashum, just talking about um, the way that plants can absorb amino acids directly out of the soil which is a totally different nutrient stream, which I'm gonna say in a minute as well. Um, so all tested plant species, including plants from all major mycorrhizal types and non-mycorrhizal species have been found to possess the capacity to take up amino acids. It's a direct, you know, highly high integrity form of nutrition compared with what we've done. So uh, yeah, so I've said that. So, and this is another quote from some famous doctors that have studied cancer, and they say, if impaired mitochondrial energy metabolism underlines the origin of most cancers as proposed, then protecting mitochondria, mitochondria from damage through better nutrition becomes a logical and simple approach for preventing cancer. So we're talking about the sort of nutrition that we, you know, used on our livestock, you know, Everyone said we couldn't do organics on the coast. Everyone said the animals would get sick, the animals would need drenching, the animals would need this. Um, I believed in this principle. I believed in this principle. If we got the soil right, if we got the nutrition right, we'd be okay. And are we okay, Henry? Yeah, we're okay. So, so to end that quote, in principle, there are few chronic diseases more easily preventable than cancer. And we've got how many billions of dollars being spent worldwide? trying to do something about cancer, and we, how many studies have we had on this link between soil and health? Yeah. None. Um, and a famous humus researcher, he also said, oh, the, am the amount of water and of nutrient salts absorbed by the colloidal system is of great agricultural significance, since it is in this system that the major microbiological activities take place. It is in this system and not the free soil solution, which is of great importance in the study of the availability of ver various nutrient elements for the growth of higher plants. And William Albrecht said, the transpiration stream of water from the soil through the plant and into the atmosphere is independent of the nutrient stream from the soil into the roots. Nutrients intake Nutrient intake by crops is a function of three colloids, or possibly four. The clay colloid, or humus colloid, the root touching up against the humus or clay colloid, taking the protein across, and the contents of the cell going straight into the plant. We eat the plant, we're all healthy. Just became, yeah. I was gonna have a joke, but I better not. I was gonna say, I was just, just became a doctor. My little niece calls me Professor Greengrass because I'm always talking about <laughs> the grass. So the pathway for nutrition ensuring true protein delivery is absolutely vital in ensuring optimum health of our cells and prevention of mitochondria damage, as mentioned by Thomas and Shel Shelton. Um, the Nutrition Security Institute in the United States has three vital points to secure the future health. Soil, ag soil organic matter is essential for sustaining healthy populations of microbes, which we know microorganisms are directly responsible for producing vital biochemicals, which are the basis of, for the nutrition of plants. Healthy soils are responsible for the production of foodborne antibiotics, vitamins, phytochemicals and amino acids, which are vital to the health of humans. So there we have it. Right. Um, 
and talk a little bit more about water. Could I just know how I'm going for time? Who's doing halfway? Oh yeah, heaps of time. I'll slow down. So <laughs> I'm doing a bit of a rush act because I want to get through a few slides as well. So, so humus and water, um, you know, we're talking about the situation out there at the moment where a lot of Australia is starting to die, literally the forests and the water cycle and, and they're getting in a condition where just, we've been losing the water cycling, I believe for 100, 150 years, but particularly in the last sort of 80, say, when we've really started to devastate the environment. Um, but, you know, it's not a new issue and um, we've known about degrading landscapes and losing water cycles for thousands of years. So this is um, out of a book titled Water, it's USDA, the USDA yearbook 1955. Um, the whole thing um, was about assessing, you know, hydrology, water supplies, what created water, the soils, the, the snowfall in the United States. And I've just been down to Canberra doing some lobbying and I've actually suggested that we actually do something similar in Australia, just to map out our complete water cycle, hydrology, everything in Australia. So we actually know where we're at and like get serious about, you know, rehydrating the country, not band-aids. I mean, the amount of money we're spending on band-aids, we could have actually helped restore a lot of the water cycle for good, but, um, and maybe supported organic farming, you know, across broad areas of Australia. So, in 400 BC, this, this was a quote out of that book, um, Plato described how the hills of Attica had been transformed from grand forests and pastures into bare hills and how this deterioration of the hillside resulted in a loss of water from the country. So he says, the annual supply of water was not lost as it is at present through being allowed to flow over a denuded surface to the sea, but was received in all its abundance, stored in impervious Potter's earth, he calls it potter's earth, which suggests just clay, I'm just throwing this in, but I'd suggest there was some humus in there as well. And so was able to discharge the drainage of the heights into the hollows in the form of springs and rivers with an abundant volume and wide territorial distribution. We've got to get the landscape back in order. And um, yeah, we really need to, you know, get that respect, you know, that worldview because we just, you know, greenfield, what is a greenfield site? That's like healthy landscape ready for building or roads. I, I mean, I vacant land, I mean, that's a term I really detest as well. What is vacant land? It's like pasture or forest, you know, like really like we've got to start, you know, connecting our thinking a bit with the water cycle and the climate. So landscapes with good levels of humus provide one of the biggest reservoirs for fresh water supplies on the planet. This is due to the large surface area, the super sponge-like qualities of the humus plasma, the overall effect this has on the entire structure of the soil matrix. The reservoir, when fully hydrated, is re responsible for ensuring regular functioning of local water soils, as well as providing the source of water for river flows. Um, and I've already mentioned how much water a healthy soil can hold. Um, when we're looking at humus, you know, it's a very complex subject and there's all sorts of different, there's forest humus and there's mineral soil humus and there's, there's, there's you know, 10 different types of humus. So we, sort of, we talk about it in general terms, but we've got to be careful because there is a lot of different forms of humus. Peat moss is a form of humus. It's, you know, so I think it can hold 25 times its weight in water from what I remember. So yeah, that's what I say. Every soil's different, the amount of water it holds. But. So going forward with a new worldview and, and a greater culture respect, um, I sort of going to go back to my hero again here, and I, I, I had the fortune, fortunate experience a few years ago of attending a sustainable leadership course. And when we were doing the um, course, an Aboriginal elder did the welcome to country, and the, and he asked, he did the welcome, and uh, or I'm not sure if he'd done the welcome or he's about to, and anyway, said to the course leader, why, why are these young people, why are you here today? You know, why are the young, and she said that you guys are studying sustainability leadership. And he looked a bit puzzled and he didn't know what that was. And so she explained in a bit more detail and then he realized it was, it was what the Aboriginals were doing for 60,000 years. So he didn't say anything. He just got this grin from ear to ear. And I, 
And I describe it as one of the greatest lessons of my life because that intrinsic culture, and I was sitting with an Aboriginal the other night and he said, you know, every stick, every rock, every tree, bit of grass was family. But this Aboriginal elder, when he smiled and I just, I thought, my God, it's all in there. It's in there. It's not here, you know. These will get lost, burnt, disregarded, put in a filing cabinet. You know, government, how many agencies have got, governments got working on sustainability strategies and what have we got out in the landscape? So for me, I just went, wow. You know, that, that was a big, big lesson. So, it, and it hit me, you know, some of you might have heard about the elevator pitch where you've got to tell someone in a few minutes when you're going up and down the elevator why you exist, what's your purpose in life. You've got literally half a minute. And so we had to do that in that course as well. But, and the Aboriginal, you know, why, why does all life exist? What has life done ever since it started four billion years ago? It's actually enhanced the earth. It's actually built more life. It's evolved. It's created in this beautiful planet. And the, the trees, you know, they're, they're, they're sending up biology to make rain and the, the fungal spores and the bacteria, you know, they're going up in the clouds and, you know, they're just colonising more area. And, and so the purpose of most life is to actually enhance the condition of the earth. And I thought, surely that's our purpose as well. What are we doing, you know? Um, we're the only species that's knowingly destroying, you know, our home. So it rocked me, you know? And I mean, I, I had to, I was on my way back from, a, the course was up near Ballon, and I was on my way back to Inverell and I, I had to pull over. I had to just stop. I couldn't drive, I literally couldn't drive any of this. And I went to the library. So I thought someone's written about this, this, this culture, you know, and, and who should have written about it? Then I'm, you know, a bit of research in the library. Um, Suzuki and Nudson, he had a fellow joint author in that one. Um, so they found that indigenous will, wisdom regard the human obligation to maintain the balance and the health of the natural world as a solemn spiritual duty that an individual must perform daily, not simply as admirable abstract ethical imperatives that can be ignored as one chooses. So they continue. We might hope that in the years ahead, a global science compatible native ecological consciousness might emerge and help inspire non-natives to adopt similar environmental values. And we might hope that in the process, a host of the calmer, more compassionate and more far-sighted voices of society's wisest elders native and scientific might be held more clearly above the din. Voices that are rooted in an ever present distant time that binds together all forms of life in a sacred ecology that unabashedly embraces and sanctifies nature, yet remains informed by the most subtle and compelling truths of modern science. Voices that can convey to ordinary people a vision of the natural world that has embedded within it an enduring environmental ethic and that is imbued in a visceral feeling for the horrific consequences of human folly, ignorance and denial of the biosphere's fate. I thought that was beautifully written, combining modern and indigenous knowledge. So that was 1992. Yeah, stuck in a library somewhere. So I believe all of the issues I've discussed today are linked and I also believe we have all of the tools and knowledge we need to turn things around. But we really do need to start treating this crisis with our health, water and climate with the urgency it deserves. And I think there's a young lady that most of you would have heard about who says treat a crisis as a crisis, young Greta Thunberg. So what is the situation on the ground right now? So far this year, in our district, we have suffered devastating heat waves, fires. I think I've already mentioned all that. Losses, you know, the wildlife, the devastation on the wildlife is just astronomical. So it is my strong belief that we are at the start of a mass um, event, bleaching event on land if we do not take action. The question again is, when are we going to commence turning things around and demand a greater vision? And I'm sending that message out, out of this room, you know, uh, when do we start? We know the answer has to be today. So 
that's the end of my notes. So I'm just going to talk through the slides now. Um, I'm pretty hopeless at doing two things at once, so I've separated the, the slideshow from the, the talk. But um, yeah, this is the Grafton property. Um, you can see where Pig Trees Organic Farms got its name from that slide. Um, and we'll see how I go with the technology now. Oh yeah, here we go. So um, yeah, that was just after I got to the Grafton property and um, we've probably got a, a very, you know, uh, poor quality grass. I guess it, that'd be carpet grass, a coastal grass, which was introduced by the Department of Ag. When the soils got poor, we just kept getting a poorer grass to come in for a while there. You know, we, we, um, a valuer told me the coastal um, area, he, he's since passed away, but when he was a young bloke, the, when he got to the coast, it was covered in the most beautiful mosaic of soft native grasses. And then we started introducing grasses, but um, that's my middle son that turned 23 yesterday <laughs> on the pony. The pony didn't want to go, and the sock horse wanted to go too fast, as you can see. But, so, so yeah, just um, observing the landscape. You know, we'd be screaming for rain like right now. Um, six inches would fall, and most of it would go into the Clarence River. Um, and it's a bit of a sandy soil too. So if you got prolonged rainfall, most of it would go through the soil. So we didn't get the benefit. And that's when I started to really start to understand humus. So that's the same paddock a few years ago. So we, we've still got introduced grasses, very hard to get the natives back. Um, the young bloke and his brothers would have helped plant those trees down the bottom, which are growing nicely. Uh, that'd be Splendor Soteria with roads and um, it, it was a nice mosaic of different species when we put it in. Um, for the first, I forget, I was about seven years, maybe a bit longer, we didn't see any legumes at all on the hill. And as the soil changed, the legumes and different forbs and stuff started coming. Um, today, that paddock's quite short, but we're still maintaining uh, under Henry's wonderful manage management, we've, we've maintained the, you know, the ground cover and the soil's ready to to go. Um, at Inverell, we've had to totally destock so that we didn't destroy our soil. So when it rains, the humus is still there. Um, but we are now getting what I thought would happen. We're getting totally impacted by, by climate and um, the water, water cycle breakdown. So that was just the results of the humus study that I did, um, just looking at it. It's quite conservative, really. That pre-settlement level's probably wrong because I'm looking at carbon levels were probably sort of 6% and humus is 56% carbon or something. So um, humus levels would have been probably 10%. There's Henry again. Um, so yeah, one of the main tools we use is holistic management, getting as many cattle as we can in small paddocks and, and you know, using that livestock impact to walk in the organic matter and help build that humus. You want to try and get the organic matter in contact with the soil so the biology can grab it and start making the humus. So, um, yeah, and Henry, Henry would be happy to talk about that with anyone later on, um, as I will be, but he's, um, he's looking after the Grafton property. This is the Inverell property, and it, it's a lot bigger challenge. The, we've, we've planted thousands of trees over the years as well. Um, but yeah, this was a few years ago. <laughs> I, I sometimes have a bit of luck at a field day, but then, you know, we'd, we'd had a bit of good rain just before that one, and that's actually um, a lot of height of clover on a, on, you can see what the landscape used to look like. Today, it's, it's, we're maintaining probably more cover than most, but it's dry, it's really dry. And eventually the elements will start to, you know, oxidise that dry matter and you've still got the kangaroos. And so if, if the rain, it's too long between rainfall, um, eventually we'll lose our cover. We haven't yet, but we will. And, um, but the soil is still intact and we haven't compacted the soil. So I'm hoping that the humus is still there to, to bounce. Um, one of the problems, as I said, with building carbon is if it gets too hot, um, not only will we lose temperate plants, but Selman Waxman, who was the guru of humus in the early 30s, 
said if you get over 34, no, 24 degrees soil temperature, it's very hard to build carbon. So in a lot of landscapes now, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be really challenging. So my optimism 20 years ago is, is, is getting dampened as time goes on, and it's, it's why I hit the road, it's why I'm urgent. Um, yeah. Um, some of the cattle, so they sort of dressed out about 250. They'd be all milk tooth, you know, when they go off at 250 dressed and, and just melt in your mouth. And they've got all the omega-3 and conjugated linoleic acid, all those things that help prevent cancer, you know. That was one of the things. And um, I was talking to Tim earlier and you know, just his involvement with Acres over the years, that beautiful newspaper and magazine we used to get. But it was a little ad in that that I first saw a little little talk at Lismore to see Graham Sait talking about, you know, nutrition. I think he had um, the two-up tour and the three-up tour, so Jerry Bernetti and Gary Zimmer and um, Jerry Bernetti just talking about grass-fed meat and the health advantages of it. And I just, I, I was sold. I, you know, we, we, we just couldn't think about eating feedlot. Um, it's challenging when we go out sometimes and there's not much on the menu. Oh, uh, yeah, so this is something I wanted to talk about. See if I can find the notes on this. But this, some of you may have come across the human interactome, but it's the study of basically the genes in our body interacting with proteins. So we've got um, something like 23,000 genes and 9 million microbial genes in our microbiome interacting with 100,000 proteins, forming different. Um, compounds which are vital for your health. So, uh, where is it? So yeah, what I just said. So, so I'm sitting at a um, Mind Foundation thing on health as one of the only farmers there. And as I said, they're talking about microbiomes and the effect of nutrition on autism and all sorts of, the, the rate of childhood disease is going up and up. And I see a slide like this and I just think, oh my God, like, you know, and, and this was made through really beautiful amino acids and proteins coming out of the food and the nutrition. And a scientist, whenever he was around the 1840s, said we can go to a lab and pour chemicals over the soil and grow food. So we had 500,000 different compounds and these amino acids coming out of the soil. So. We've just really compromised nutrition. But then I took it to another level because I'm not really a doctor. I sometimes pretend to be, but um, that, don't record that. Um, now, <laughs> so now imagine the number of genes. Um, let's say there's 10,000. I've just done some quick maths. And as I said, I wasn't an A-grade scholar, but um, I've converted the microbiome biology to a hectare of soil in the top 30 centimetres. So I've come up with 10,000 quadrillion microbes in a hectare of soil. That's the microbes. So then multiply that by the number of genes interacting with how many hundreds of thousands or, yeah, of um, different proteins and compounds in the soil. And just think again what we have done to our landscapes, you know, this is just the nutrition side. This is not looking at the water and the climate and, and yeah, this would be a good one for you, Ash, to follow up on this. <laughs> um, so. I, I can understand that so Yeah, yeah, you, you know what every one of those <laughs> combinations are. So, so yes, yeah, so basically there's a lot of stuff going on in nature that we've totally discounted. And this is that process of three colloids, so basically when protein's going through from the humus colloid to the root membrane colloid, and so it goes through something called plasmolema, which I, I just found this diagram just totally amazing. These, these channels are just built in the cells for transferring these beautiful proteins that we talk about, not in a water-soluble form, not in a nitrate form, we, which we convert through our mathematical equation to protein, but in a true, true protein sense. So, um, and I wondered when I was going to get to this, but 
once again, the biology. So scientists are now saying that when it rains, microbe bioaerosols, the microbes come out of the forest, the fungal spores and bacteria, they pour out of the forest floor and they're, they're actually seeding more rain. So they increase by 60, 160 and per minute for the first 10 minutes. So the first rain triggers more. And this is why that staging of rainfall, that the importance of wetlands and vegetation and floodplains, because every time the rain moves a bit, it's hitting more area and there's more bioaerosol. So like when you think about it, how does it, how, how did general rain go for fortnight? Did it just like happen and it was just up in the sky and just get, no, something was making it happen. So scientists have sort of worked out these bioaerosols now. And, and so <laughs> you've seen this photo before, Henry. Yeah, so I, I was leaving the Grafton property and I could see an anvil thunderhead forming somewhere over the mountain range. So as I drove up the hill, I took a series of photos, one from the farm, one halfway there. And then I identified, it's like, it was like a smokestack where the arrow is. And I actually took a photo of it, which I'm glad I did. When I got up there, it was actually, you could see the area that this smokestack was coming out of that created that, that thunderhead. And it was, it was the Washpool National Park. So it was this tiny little bit of area that escaped logging, thanks to some people that protected it years ago. But all the biology, all the moisture, everything was happening there. Now that probably, that little bit of forest was probably servicing an area, you know, 100 kilometre radius, you know, like, so we were 80 kilometres away and that night we got 25 mils from that rainforest. And, you know, that's a vacant bit of land, really. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, and, and it was the intact forest that was doing it. You know, it wasn't the dry forest, the degraded forest, the grazed forest. You know, a lot of our forest is in a really degraded state as well. So we've got so much work to do. Um, <laughs> I had to throw that in, didn't I? So, yeah, it was just an old slide, but um, as I said, I've got my message out there whatever way I can. And um, a few years ago, um, because of my concern for future generations, I, I took my uh, buckskin down to the city and, and went for a, a joyride across the Harbour Bridge, which was a lot of fun. Um, and I stole this quote from Charles Massey, but um, I'm sure he won't mind. But um, it's uh, my youngest son when we started doing the in rail property. And um, yeah, so the ultimate test of a moral society is kind of well. Um, society is failing at the moment, aren't we? Pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's just in case anyone wants to swim later, but you get <laughs> tempted. But yeah, we're losing, we're losing beautiful places like this rapidly. So 